Yeah, thanks, Alison. Andy Norton, Research Director, ODI. Fairly directly on that, um, and on the question of um, donor support to tax capacity, um, are there realistic, practical options to favour more progressive and less, re and less regressive forms of taxation? How can donor technical assistance take account of the distributional impacts? Um, it's obviously material to achieving the SDGs. Um, if you wind up taxing poor people, it may have negative impacts also on their capacity to reach certain goals. So what would be the balance of, of thought and how would you do it if you were going to go that way? Okay, very good. Right, um, let's go, let's couple more, Maya and Alistair, and then we'll move to the now, middle Alice, section. Alistair McKirkney, um, one, quick, one thing that was never mentioned by anybody uh, are the revenues or subsidies to and from public enterprises. And as we talk about investing more in infrastructure, you have power utilities in many countries are a major drain on the budget because they don't cover their operating costs. Roads don't get maintained, yet fuel is, is, is subsidised, whereas a, a, a road user charge on fuel might fix those. So I, I just wondered if that's an issue that needs attention. The other point is there's no mention of, of wealth taxes, yet Piketty wrote this very um, influential book um, last, last year about the importance of... Um, of, ta of taxing wealth, and one could see in a fragile state coming out of conflict, I mean, as, as, as Piketty mentions, after the French Revolution, illegal assets um, could be revealed and taxed and then get the protection <coughs> of the state. So is this, are there ways of regularizing otherwise black money Great. through wealth tax? Maya? Uh, thanks, Maya King from Queen Mary. Uh, uh, my question is about corporation tax. Um, by giving corporation tax to, as a policy recommendation for developing countries, are we giving them an obsolete technology? Because um, some people think that corporation tax is only gonna last a decade or a few more decades. So um, shouldn't we be giving them more modern, future, forward-looking tax policies rather than backward-looking ones? Great. Okay, thank you. There's a cluster in, in wow. Yeah, we're starting mm -hmm. to take off now. Mm -hmm. uh, Anna Thomas, not from ODI, <laughs> <laughs> from ActionAid. Um, I, I wanted to pick up on uh, tax treaties that a couple of you mentioned. Um, so these, this is a sort of network of bilateral agreements, doesn't get very much attention between countries, uh, which essentially um, limits usually developing countries' kind of rights to tax companies. Um, uh, they generally enter into these um, a, as one of the sort of signals um, to uh, attract investment, although that doesn't, we don't know how well that works or not, the evidence is divided. Um, seem, this seems to me like an interesting area that's very underexplored, uh, so I wanted to ask all of you, do you think, is this something uh, where we should be putting a bit more policy attention? Should um, Should countries entering into treaties, uh, sh should, should the circumstances they do this be reviewed? Should uh, developed countries be looking more carefully at where they enter into treaties? Should developing countries be advised to be more careful about how they do it? Hmm. Great, thank you. Right behind you, um, and then we'll come forward. Just as you're passing the microphone, there is a question from Janizani Lewewe who is an MSc student at, in Bradford University. How do developing countries expand their tax base, especially given the potential revenues in the large informal sector? So a question there to add to the mix. Yeah. Hi. My name is Hamish Nixon. I am from ODI as well. Um, I just wanted to ask if any of the speakers want to build on Kieran's very brief mention of local governments in which many low-income countries and also many conflict-affected countries are undergoing processes of decentralization. So central tax revenue reform is actually quite political in those contexts, and that's one consideration. Additionally, I think many of the governance effects that we ascribe to domestic revenue, as you mentioned, Karen, are most effective at the local level in terms of being a foundation for social contract. So. Is there a difference between what donors can or should do for subnational revenues as opposed to the national level? Mm. Okay, good. I'm going to, to John here, and then I'm going to have to start collecting a few for the next round. So John Burton first, and then I'll come around to the next round. Uh, we've heard uh, 
sorry, John Burton from KPMG. We've heard a couple of times that very little aid is spent in the area of promoting domestic revenue mobilization. And it kind of went through my mind, well, uh, why is it necessary for donors to fund that? Because governments themselves presumably can fund that and they'll make a profit on, on what they invest. So if you go to the Minister of Finance when you're the tax commissioner and say, you know, give me 10 more people and I'll generate you 10 times that in revenue, that ought to be a compelling reason for governments to fund that themselves. Uh, that was one question. Another question I had, which was probably more at Michael's end, was what is the right tax to GDP <laughs> ratio for low-income countries? It's gone up from 10 to 15 percent, but if you think about the bill for development, 15 percent of a low-income uh, GDP is, is not very much, is it? I don't know what it might be, 50 to 100 dollars or something, uh, which is probably not enough. So, so this kind of debate about, you know, do we need uh, tax revenue or do we need aid is a false debate because we need them both. Uh, and it's just about allocating them correctly is sort of m my take on it. Thanks. Okay. So hold on to your questions, everybody. Uh, we'll come around for the second round. I'm, I'm going to ask, actually, Kieran, whether you would take that, certainly the point about uh, why do we need aid to support um, revenue authorities in particular. Maybe you want to comment on the local government question. Just to say to Rob, the iPad's run out of battery. So <laughs> any questions online, I'm afraid, are now not coming <coughs> to me. Um, Kieran, would yeah, you like to? Yeah, I, I think uh, wh why, why countries need, you're right. Um, when, in, in all the countries where I've worked, the, uh, the cost of collecting tax <coughs> is about two and a half, two, two and a half percent of the revenue brought in. So you would think that spending an extra uh, amount of money on, on uh, from, from, the, from the host, from the recipient country itself, from the country itself, would, would be a logical thing to do. But it's, uh, in practice, it's extremely difficult to get countries to do that. Um, also, the, uh, the, the, the scale of the initial investments can be quite high. Um, in Rwanda, uh, we, when, we, when we did the Rwanda Revenue Authority project, TFID <coughs> was the sole supporter of the Rwanda Revenue Authority from the development perspective. The government provided the 2.5%, 3% every year and so on. But all of the investment in technical assistance, in new laws, in IT systems, in drafting new procedures, uh, doing training, capacity building and so on, was picked up by DFID. And the cost over a 12-year period, although I don't think DFID intended it to be that much, was 24 million pounds, which you might say is a lot of money. But at the end of the project, the Rwanda Revenue Authority was collecting 24 million pounds, equivalent in Rwanda uh, revenue francs, ev every, um, every two, to two and a half weeks. And that's a huge uh, investment return, which you, you don't see anywhere uh, in, in either the public or private sectors anywhere. But yet, it's, t it's extremely difficult to convince governments that this will be the case if they make those investments. Secondly, some governments, many governments in fact, uh, are loath to engage in tax reform unless they're pushed by donors because they don't really want to become accountable to their own taxpayers and they don't really want, they're in a comfort zone with, with aid and so on from other sources and they don't want to engage uh, at that level. So I think it's, it's something that intuitively you, you would think that they would want to do themselves, but in reality, I think it needs to be driven by, by donors and pushed by donors. Okay, thanks. Oliver, do you want to pick up on a question? There was a one about progressive and regressive taxes. Yes, do you want to um, something on that? The basic problem is for, for the low-income countries, we, we know we don't really know much about actually how progressive or, or regressive the taxes are. And in one sense, because, and it relates to I think the online, it might be the mm -hmm. online comment about the I informal sector is, well, it's true, it, you know, the problem with these countries is, however you define it, the informal sector is very large, but it's also very poor. Mm. So, you know, it's, there are some types of ways that they do end up paying taxes, but, but most of the people there have you know, they're in the informal sector, so they have irregular work, irregular pay, low earnings from any evidence we have, that the vast majority of very low evidence, earnings, so they wouldn't be in the tax system anyway. They may pay some taxes on, on what they consume, but even there, 
you know, you're hardly likely to be paying VAT if you're actually purchasing from a roadside trailer in a, a roadside trader in a rural area or a local market. Um, so, you know, it, it pro by and large, tax in low-income countries mm. probably is progressive, in the sense <laughs> that it's, it, it, you know, companies do pay a large share, um, and in fact, you know, one estimate is that the the large taxpayers' unit in most of the African countries accounts for 70% or plus of tax mm. revenues. Yes. Mm. So it's the large, and, and it's not just their profits tax, it's the largest companies are also collecting all of the VAT. They're also the ones paying taxable wages. So it is a, it's the small tax base. So the, the vast majority are not being taxed. And in that sense, it is progressive because it's only the, um, the relatively richer groups that are being taxed. Um, again, I think that, I really think that the problem is, the ultimate problem is growing, is increasing formal sector employment. Because you know, if you think of developed countries, that's where most tax revenue comes from, what people earn and what they spend. And if you don't get them on their earnings, you get them on their spending. But you get the vast majority of the population that way, and that's where most of the tax revenue comes from. Um, the, the loopholes and all of those need to be addressed, but you're not going to get a sustained, significant increase unless there's real economic growth in incomes um, for, the, for the mass of the population. And that would be politically more, I think, plausible, because they then don't have to implement tax reforms that hit their friends. Yeah, I follow up quickly yeah, on that. Just, yeah. just quickly to follow up on that. The tax reforms that I've, I've outlined are, are actually highly, highly progressive. Uh, if you bring non-residents into the charge of tax, which formerly were not taxed, that's a progressive move. If you reduce tax exemptions, which go to favoured individuals or favoured companies, that's a progressive move. If you can enforce taxation on rental incomes, that's a progressive move. Um, uh, if, if you can force governments to... to apply withholding taxes to high income employees which before before they were not doing that's a that's a progressive move when we've cut tax rates as, as parts of these reforms we've also managed to uh, increase uh, exempt amounts and uh, reduce lower tax rates so again that's that's a that's a progressive move so overall the, 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 these these uh, high level um, uh, reform programs can be highly progressive but the agenda you've set out there, Kieran, is, is, as you've said yourself, very much about confronting elites. Yes. I suppose the question is, to what extent does aid take away the need to confront elites? <coughs> and therefore, is it, in a sense, softening <laughs> the, the, the imperative to go out and confront those, yes. you know, those well-established sources of, 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 of tax loss or whatever? Mm -hmm. Michael, do you want to pick up the point about corporation tax particularly? Well, yes. I mean, uh, I just also did want to add to, to, to the remarks... Yeah. Um, on informality, with which I very much agree. I mean, I think it's often sort of overstated as, you know, the problem in, in these countries. But I think it does link with the point you were making at the start about, about the links with governance. Um, because, you know, give, given the sort of re recent interest in tax as an issue of state building, you have to ask, well, what difference does that actually make mm. to the standard advice that people like the fund have been giving for years? And one, I think, would potentially be in that area, because I think, as, uh, really, as Oliver was hinting, if you do a standard sort of um, calculation of administration costs, compliance costs, distortions, and revenue, uh, many of the people in the informal sector should not be in the tax system. I mean, they shouldn't be in. I mean, on a rational calculation, they'd be out. That's where, if you wanted to say, well, no, there's some additional kind of state building concern. That was where that could make a difference to the kind of policy advice we give. But I think that's very different. I mean, you know, as I think as... Uh, uh, you know, as Oliver says, when you go where, to some extent, you have to go where the money is, and that's not that's not where it is, um, which I think would be the role for these additional uh, considerations. Maybe just uh, to pick up a couple of the other ones, there was also a treatise question, I and mean, I very much agree. I mean, I think our view f for a number of years has been that developing countries should should think more than twice about uh, signing uh, tax treaties. Exactly. I think there has been a there has been a sense that you know to be a to be a proper country you have to have all these tax treaties and have something for the president to sign. <laughs> um, it's a little bit like trade reform as well that these things get done often not by the Ministry of Finance they get done by foreign affairs. You know, foreign affairs says we need a treaty, or uh, you know, the, the trade industry says we need a, we need a, you know we need to to cut tariffs. 
Um, so I think treaties, I mean, I think that's becoming more the conventional wisdom now. We used to have to say it very quietly. We don't say it quite, quite as quietly as, as we do now. But I think it also relates to the interesting question about um, why can't governments fund uh, some of these reforms? And I think treaties is a very interesting example because one of the, when you say, well, countries should think twice about treaties, what that means is hire a good lawyer. And good lawyers are expensive. I mean, some do, it, some do these things pro bono, but, mm. you know, there's so much money involved in getting a tax treaty right yeah. or wrong that clearly the first advice would be go to a, a good lawyer and many many countries don't don't do it even though it's clear that the, it's clear that the money at stake is, 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 is easily it's easily a, a sensible investment so there is a bit of a some a, to some extent a bit of a puzzle there I mean countries I think are there I suppose the, you know sovereignty kind of issues that no this is our this is our stuff we will do it um, but the trouble is that that can can backfire rather um, Corporate tax, I thought it was a very good I thought it was a very good question. I think it's also, you know, to be honest, I think you could make the point more generally. You could say what the world in general has done, and my department in particular, in many sense for the last fifty years, has been to try and sell in developing countries completely inappropriate instruments. You know, the first wave of, of, of technical advice to countries was to have a progressive income tax, taxing the sum of labor income and capital income at the same rate, which we can't do in, we can't do in advanced economies. Um, so, and if the corporate tax, the corporate tax is so, even the basic corporate tax is so complicated. And um, why not have, for example, a simple cash flow tax, which would be much simpler, and it's the sort of thing actually we recommend for resources. So I think there is a historic mistake, but I think in the specific context of corporate tax, you know, I think in a way my remark about the U.S. removing corporate tax was, was only 60% was only a joke because a lot of the reforms that you might think of uh, to make the corporate tax more sensible would actually, I won't get into the technicalities, but actually mean would be very similar to increasing the rate of VAT and cutting labor taxes, which is what a lot of countries are doing anyway. I think the argument for, for so, you know, it's a perfectly reasonable response to all the fuss about Apple and Google and so on is to say, well, let's just get rid of the corporate tax. Why? It makes no sense. I mean, who, who's actually bearing this tax? So who's benefiting what Apple doesn't pay? We don't even know these things. But I think for, for, for developing countries, I think you'd say, um, <clears throat> I'd make a slightly different argument, which is I would say that for many developing countries, we've heard about the concentration of resources in a few companies. And what that often means in many countries is basically telecoms, bank, banks, resources. And that's sort of where, that's sort of where the money is on the corporate tax side. And the corporate tax is just a convenient handle, as tariffs were. A uh, relatively convenient mm -hmm. handle. But okay, yeah. let me go out for another round. I'm going to stick here in the front row. I think there's three in a row. Then I'll come back, yeah. and I see you, Simon. Can I have the mic. Thanks. Oh, thank you. I'm <coughs> reconnected. Thank you. <coughs> three percent battery. Okay. Thank you, uh, Edward Pace <laughs> from Africa Research Institute. Uh, in the context of a previous question mentioning financing of um, decentralization and, and, and local governance um, or local government um, can the panel uh, uh, give some views on the both the potential and the practicality of increasing property tax um, uh, we're seeing this very much coming to the fore at the moment and a very quick qu second question perhaps for Kieran I can think of at least half a dozen instances over the last decade where um, ambassadors of various nations um, European nations in Africa have sought to um, uh, gnash their teeth over corruption uh, with um, with governments in self in sub-Saharan Africa and have actually had their approach tempered by their own development ministries in who have favored um, perhaps a slightly more inert, inert approach uh, in in favor of um, not rocking the boat um, is this a problem when you are in the sort of position that you have found yourself in. Thank you. Okay, Jeremy. Thanks very much. Uh, Jeremy Clark, um, CAPE Associate and uh, Independent Consultant. Um, I'd just like to ask the panel to say a bit more about the political context and political trends, if they would. Um, I think, you know, looking <coughs> back to when revenue authorities in various sub-Saharan African countries were set up, it's uh, fairly clear that they were given the power and authority to go after uh, corrupt individuals to you know, address tax exemptions and to introduce a rules-based uh, organization in many uh, instances, often using uh, external assistance uh, in the form of people like Kieran and others uh, funded by, by donors. So 
Um, if that was the case at the beginning, what happened subsequently? You know, it, was that political support and that space continued over time, or d did things revert back to a more sort of patronage-based system with, um, you know, bribery in the taxpaying system and the kind of problems that we're familiar with? And um, to what extent can we say anything about um, in, in some ways, the success story. I mean, clearly revenue, uh, revenue GDP ratios have been sustained in low-income countries. Does that mean that in some sense um, the political pressures have lessened or is it simply that the extra revenue is being uh, diverted and used for party political financing or other things in addition to development um, uh, expenditures and, and uh, priorities? And if I may, quickly, a, a second question. Um, I, I was involved in working on a number of the Revenue Authority projects, and there were several of them. You know, there was support to Zambia, Ghana, uh, Uganda, Tanzania. So there's a lot of aid put in, in the 90s in particular. So it's interesting to hear um, the comment that th this is an area that needs more aid now. So my question is why? Um, was it clearly the job in some sense wasn't <laughs> done? Or maybe there's a new job to be done, but it'd be interesting to know uh, what the background to that is, because it was an area that certainly received a substantial amount of support quite successfully, it, se it seems. Okay, next door. Just before you make your intervention, uh, Chennai Mukumba from Cuts International asks, uh, should development finance be flowing at all into countries with poor transparency records? But we'll, that comes to your point, I think. Yes, go ahead. Okay, uh, Chris Wales from PwC and formerly of, uh, of the UK Treasury. Um, I'd be interested in the panel's views on the way in which uh, donor money is, is directed in the area, in the taxation area. Um, we heard earlier that a very small proportion of, uh, of donor funding actually goes towards tax projects uh, in the first place. And uh, very often we see that the projects that are financed are relatively small interventions, uh, or at least quite narrowly focused interventions. And Kieran, I'd be quite interested in your view on uh, on how uh, on how money is spent on information technology and whether that's in your view the best way of uh, of spending the money clearly a very large proportion of of donor funding goes to uh, spend on uh, on ICT um, uh, more recently we've seen diffid looking at uh, a, a kind of a more holistic approach to uh, to interventions in this area and to in particular to linking together uh, tax <coughs> policy the uh, the whole collection and inspection process and transparency as well. Uh, to me, that seems a much more sensible approach. Uh, it's a whole country approach. <coughs> it's a much more expensive approach. And uh, if it's going to work, then it has to be sustained over, over a long period of time. So it will be interesting to see whether there is donor appetite to, uh, to do that and maintain it. Um, we've had some questions about, uh, about support for decentralization as well. I'm not aware of, of almost any money being put by donors into uh, into decentralisation of of, uh, of revenue raising and uh, and revenue collection. So again, it'd be quite interesting to know what the panel thinks about about that issue, because in many ways the the democratic deficit in in this area can best be addressed. It seems to me by uh, by bringing tax collection, tax raising to a lower level, mm. but it brings with it some other issues as well. Uh, which are, are quite complicated. Um, I'm not sure how much the IMF is, is planning to do in that area, but it seems to be something that's, that's growing a little bit more in, in importance. So should this be something that the donor funding is targeted at? And how do you deal with this corruption issue? And how much of, of donor funding towards uh, the tax system should be specifically directed to, to dealing with the corruption issue, which, you know, which is rife at, at lower levels in many, uh, in many uh, tax administrations? But even if it's sorted out there at a policy level, it's often very easy for, uh, for politicians and top officials to give away all the gains uh, at a single stroke. Okay, great, thanks. Just come back here for one more on this round. There's a gentleman here in the brown, with a brown tie. Hi, I'm Pelle Persson from CEDA, Sweden. Uh, Sweden is usually in the top three infamous league of tax uh, uh, payment. And, uh, uh, and the Swedes normally pay, uh, happily pay taxes. So uh, contrary to what Oliver <laughs> said, uh, <laughs> They do. It. And why is that? And, and I, I have two questions, and they were partly touched upon um, previously here. Uh, but one reason is that a big part of the um, 
public funds are used by local authorities, I think 60-70%. So there's a, a direct uh, connection to seeing results. Uh, so the question is, is whether you have any evidence of if, if uh, that is the case in some of the poor countries. I know that the, the, the poorer the country is, normally the, the, the less of the public finance uh, revenue are used by local authorities. I think it's 5-10% in, in low-income countries in, uh, uh, at general, in general. Uh, and the, the second question uh, also was touched upon um, on land taxation. But if you put that question in a broader sense of, of land reforms, and, um, and it was mentioned that inf the informal sector is poor, but is it poor because it's informal or is it why is it it's partly maybe they are poor because they are informal so formalization of, of businesses or land would actually create values that could be used for tax so are there evidence to, to see uh, that <coughs> land reforms creating uh, property markets uh, has increased the possibilities of taxation and increased the revenues thank you very much i'm going to go back to the panel for a very quick round just pick up one, maximum two of those points. Michael, do you want to start off with something? Um, well, that was, that was quite a lot there. I mean, I think maybe just on the, on the, on the decentralisation, I think certainly, w I think it's quite complicated because there's a, there's a kind of the, the general issue of kind of fiscal federal structures, including transfers to, to lower level governments. And there's also the question of, of lower level governments raising revenue. Uh, themselves, which is a sort of so that, which is a distinct but obviously related issue. Um, I think in many countries that the, the capacity at for the f if you talk about local governments is is very poor. I mean, compared even, you know com when you're thinking about developing capacity, of central government uh, capacity at in local governments can be can be more or less zero. Um, <coughs> certainly, property tax is is often is certainly our standard recommendation for for local government finance of course in many countries it, it's a huge it's well, not a huge it's a large investment and maybe something where outside finance can help with the sort of valuation and um, and mapping and so on um, it's a slow business um, it's certainly one we support um, certainly from the fund we t we've we've do less on the actual administration at, at local level I guess partly because our relations are always basically with ministries of finance, and I think we find enough to to work on <coughs> at the central government, which is where which is where in many of these countries a lot of the uh, lot of the action is going to be. Well, then there's a separate there's a sort of separate class of countries in between, say Pakistan, where you have the state level, sort of you know more more substantive than than local uh, level, where again even the country like Pakistan capacity varies hugely across the, across the provinces. Uh, so it is it's a complicated issue. And probably is going to become more important, but it's also tied in with these wider issues of of fiscal federal relations, relations, <coughs> which is often as much a political issue as anything else. Frankly, I mean, in terms of you know, we can give technical advice, but it becomes very much a um, <coughs> a political issue. Um, I think just one one other, one other issue I did want to raise in terms of what donor funding can uh, can usefully do, which I think one one area we see increasing a lack is, is also is the capacity for tax policy analysis, which I think is something Chris would be interested in, uh, has been very active in, because, you know, quite often people like the fund and so on, we're we're asked to do to do analysis of possible tax reforms, linking with spending reforms sometimes, um, that really the country themselves ought to be able to do, and I'm talking I'm talking but even about quite big emerging market countries just don't have the capacity to do this tax analysis. So there's going to be very little ownership of reforms if they're not doing the analysis themselves. So it's, you know, I think the area of developing the tax policy capacity uh, is surprisingly weak, as I say, even in, even in large emerging countries. But I think that's clearly uh, something where a bit of a shove with some external support would be very helpful. Great, right, thank you. Oliver, do you want to pick up on something uh, there? A quick one, I think. There is potential for, certainly in Africa, there is potential to generate local revenue from local property taxes, but it's, it's small, small amounts. Um, certainly the experience <coughs> of Sierra Leone is that if you have a simple valuation, and they use just the size of the property as the base of the valuation, and a low rate, you can generate revenues. If you try to increase the rate, you're more likely to find that the valuation is contested then the administration becomes a lot more expensive because you need a more complicated valuation, 
um, so it becomes self-defeating. So to generate some <laughs> modest levels of local revenue, yes, there's potential in property taxes, but it's not going to so solve it. And just a brief response to the, um, the online comment, I think you know, <laughs> transparency or corruption should influence how donors deliver their support, not whether they deliver support, because otherwise they wouldn't have to deliver it anywhere. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Kieran, you want to pick up on this? Yeah, there was a question about um, corruption, I think. Mm. Uh, um, I, I've been in a situation where uh, donors have advised me to, to let corruption's issue lie, and, and, and that's, um, you know, to, to not disturb, not, not to rock the boat. Uh, and that's a really difficult position when you're the Commissioner General or, or when you're in a senior position in a revenue administration because if you're going to have any credibility with your staff and, and, and with the, the taxpayers who are paying their taxes, when you see corruption, you have got to say, you've got to raise the flag on it. You've got to say this, this just cannot, and you've got to advise ministers and others that this is wrong, this is illegal, this is uh, whatever <coughs> and so on, bad practice and all the rest of it. Uh, so, and, and of course, that's the that's the the approach I've taken, which has been to ignore the advice and to go ahead and tackle the issue, <laughs> uh, often at great cost. But um, but I, I think w when you're in that position, you you and, and uh, you know uh, credi credibility is everything when you when you're running a tax system, and when you when you when you don't uh, when you close your eyes to corruption, you've you've immediately lost your credibility, in my opinion. So. That's the answer on that one. <laughs> <laughs> Great, thank you. Okay, then I, I've got literally four <coughs> minutes left, so I can only take sort of two. So Simon at the back there. Yeah, but you, there was a queue kind of thing, so I need to need to, and then Rebecca over there, and then I'll come back. So keep Thanks these much. short, please. Simon Gill from ODI. Just to link in with what we've heard earlier today, if the point that Romilly and I think Kira made that not all flows are equal. What's the real value of domestic resource mobilisation? Where can it be used and how can it be put to best effect? And does that compare with other types of flow? Um, and secondly, is there a more old, outside the technical, whether we're talking about IT systems, for a more um, you know, it sort of inclusive campaign or publicity campaign to try and persuade people that paying tax is a good thing? We've heard a lot about technical inputs, but is there more a political sort of marketing campaign that needs to com be combined with that? Thanks. You can answer that as we, yeah, if you like. Uh, yeah, well, very much so. And, and uh, just to answer the second question, uh, second aspect of your, of your question, um, uh, ha having having a proper communications exercise and, and explaining to the population not not only not only what is being done but why it's being done is absolutely crucial. Um, and we, we also uh, explaining to the pop population how much revenue is being collected and and, and how you remitted it and how much. Uh, also, uh, extremely important in in, the, in Burundi. We, we issued a press release every month detailing uh, what our collections were, what our target was, whether we hit the target or not, why we, why, why we did and why we did not hit the target and so on. And that was greatly valued by the population. We also held a press conference minimum every, every three months where we sat down for three hours with the, with, the, with the entire Burundi media, explained to them what we had done for the last three months and what we were planning to do for the next three months. Okay. And again, that was greatly appreciated. Great. Thanks. Question over there, comment? Hi, um, Rebecca Simpson from the London School of Economics. Um, just another question about this link between aid and domestic revenue mobilization. Um, my sense is that there's fairly sort of quick sort of diminishing returns to aid for, um, for domestic revenue mobilization, that um, you can only really throw so much sort of TA and, and sort of support for reconstruction of revenue authorities at a, at a country before there's quite a lot of resistance to that type of support. Um, so I guess, just to play devil's advocate a bit, are we risking sort of, I don't know, crowding in too much donor support for an area that will um, not necessarily uh, be politically, politically sort of <coughs> feasible to, um, for, for the host recipient governments to respond to? Okay. That connects a bit with the Jeremy's point about, well, have we, are we essentially throwing good money after bad, in a sense? If money didn't work in the 1990s or didn't produce the transformation we were looking for, why now promote more aid for revenue sources? A final question here, a comment, and then we need to wrap this session up. 
Um, thanks very much, uh, Simon Whitfield from DFID. I just, it was more of a comment, really, to come back on some of the points that have been made earlier, and particularly the one around why don't we spend more on, um, on tax projects. Well, I think that collectively the donor community is, um, it's albeit slowly uh, increasing. I think one problem, it's a dull one, is that simply we don't know how much is currently being spent because we're just not very good. The ODA um, statistics from the OECD aren't very good at capturing what a tax project when we in the UK did it, we found out we were spending a lot more than we thought we were. Mm -hmm. And I suspect that'll be true for a lot of other donors. But I think actually the point that Kieran made about what is the, the limiting factor in tax <coughs> programming for us, as well as the success that they achieve on the ground, it's political will. Um, we have wasted a lot of money on tax projects as well as had some glorious successes because if the political buy-in isn't there at the senior level, at the ministerial level, um, we, won't get, we won't get agreement to do a project. <coughs> Projects can also be subverted from within. There's a great example from Pakistan, a huge tax program which was essentially undermined from within because, you know, political economy, we tend to think of politicians, but political economy also exists within organisations because the people whose unofficial uh, income streams were challenged by the reforms um, managed to subvert the process. I mean, but uh, I couldn't couldn't endorse more the view that this is hugely about um, politics, political economy. And we're seeing that very much just at the moment when we're trying to um, encourage countries to sign up for automatic tax information exchange. Um, as you might imagine, the um, heads of revenue authorities are very keen, but when it gets to the finance minister, there's a loss of uh, support because it potentially challenges the elites. Hmm. the cronies, the political supporters. Okay, great, thank you. I noticed nobody on the panel has attempted to answer John's question about what is uh, a kind of appropriate target for tax to GDP take in low-income countries. Anybody want to have a... Well, we won't tweet you, well, honestly. <coughs> well, I think, I think it's a fair question. There's obviously no, there's obviously no, no right answer. We know that a, a, Asian low-income countries, I think, think of a, a happier to live, well not happier to live, but I think you know you can see for example differences across regions on what people think as, a, as an appropriate tax level. So I just think there's no, I'm not going to give it, well it's a good question but I don't think there's a simple simple answer. Okay. What you can say is you can compare, you can sort of look at the data and say um, how, how much might a country raise given the kind of comparator countries that we, that we think are doing a reasonable job, but I mean I think that's, that's more or less Good. Okay. Well, many thanks very much to our panelists. That's been uh, terrifically informative, and and I think covered the waterfront very well. I think you know I can't really sort of draw all that to a conclusion, other than I think we're all in agreement that domestic revenue mobilisation is an absolute you know sine qua non for everything that's going to come in terms of the SDGs. But it can't do all the heavy lifting. There needs to be uh, some very smart blending of different financial uh, flows, including international public finance <coughs> in those areas that I think Oliver very nicely summarised in his presentation where actually uh, external finance brings real added value. Um, and, uh, you know, this is as much about the politics as it is about uh, fundamentally the, the economics of, of revenue collection. Thank you very much, everybody. And there's now a break, and I think the idea is to come back at quarter to four for the final session. Thanks. Thanks.